All right, welcome everybody. Uh, so this is going to be a quick introduction to large language models. Uh, not so much how to build them, but more how to interact with them, what we know about them now, and what their ethical implications are as well. Uh, and so today, if I can click in the right place there. We'll do a little bit of playing with chat GPT and GPT-3. I'll restrict to that. Uh, tomorrow, Seth is gonna tell us about Bing chat, but we won't do that today. Uh, chat GPT and GPT-3 are very closely related. As you see here, there are other models as well. Uh, some of them not released yet. So there's Google's upcoming BARD apparently based on their earlier Lambda system that uh, generated some controversy with uh, Blake Lemoyne claiming that it was conscious. Um, Google now also has a partnership with Anthropic, uh, which consists of uh, initially of people who left OpenAI. Um, at some point, I'll talk a little bit also about uh, text to image like DALI 2, where you, you give a prompt and it generates an image to match that prompt uh, as if the prompt is the caption for the image. Uh, and then hopefully we'll spend most of our time actually today with discussion. Uh, but first of all, I'll, I'll do this short talk and uh, we'll record that. Okay, so let's actually play with it a little bit uh, right now. So right now you should be seeing chat GPT. Uh, and so I've asked it here, I've uh, asked it here to introduce itself to you. Uh, and I gave a little bit of a description of the audience. I hope you can read it. So the audience is at Oxford. Uh, and I kind of suggested, well, if you have some connection to Oxford, please mention that. That's always nice to do in an introduction. I haven't tried this before. I'm not sure what's going to come out, um, but let's see. Okay, it points out it's not directly affiliated with Oxford. Uh, it can provide information and insights on ethics and AI. It doesn't have ethical standards of its own. It's ChatGPT is generally designed to be quite cautious uh, to say anything about having personal beliefs and uh, and so on. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Oxford has been at the forefront of research on AI ethics. Thank you. Uh, and it mentions. Uh, well, it mentioned some other institutes besides our own. Maybe we're too new uh, for it to have learned about us. Okay. Um, and if you haven't played with this before, I recommend that there's lots of things you can do with it. You can ask it to write in different styles. Uh, I spent the first year of my adult life in Southern California, so I think I'm allowed to do something like this. Where are you? Okay, so you can get it to write in different styles. Uh, it sometimes kind of drops the style after a little bit, but uh, you know, it basically gets it right. You can write in different languages. Oops, I got the capitalization wrong there. Uh, yeah, so it works very well in different languages as well. Uh, I'm a native Dutch speaker. It works quite well in Dutch as well. Um, so this is, you know, this is how chat GPT works. This is the kind of chat-based interface. Um, but it's good to know that that isn't maybe the most natural interface. Uh, I mean, for us, it's natural to interface with it through chat. Um, but really, the way these systems are designed is they're more focused on text completion. So here I have a different example. Uh, so this is the playground for GPT-3. Uh, so this is not chat GPT. It's not in chat format. Uh, but here, what you can do is you can enter text, and it will automatically complete it. And as an example that I have here, um, I'm going to imagine that we get applications, and so we summarize applications, maybe uh, for people who want to join the institute, and we summarize that with where they got, what bachelors they got, where they got it. We summarize their grades, uh, their recommendation letters, and their essay, right? And here I've given it some examples of the decisions that we then made on those uh, imagined applicants, uh, including with a little bit of a verbal justification. So here we have somebody from Harvard University. Here I made up a silly one who claims to have 
uh, a bachelor's from the University of Massifornia, which is not something that exists to my knowledge. Uh, and it, you know, it's a, the, and everything that's here so far, I wrote that, right? So this, these are just examples for the kind of thing that I now want the system to produce. And, and then here at the end, we can put in a new applicant and we can have it complete the text that we've seen so far. Right. So in machine learning, this is called supervised learning, where we have some examples, uh, we show how to classify them, and then um, we now let the system do it itself. Right. And uh, this just just shows you that you can use something like GPT to do that directly. Okay. So here, for whatever reason, it chose to reject this applicant. Um, and it made up a justification. Now you might be wonder, wondering, should you trust in a system like this? And presumably you shouldn't based on just what I did here. Um, you would at least need to give it a lot more training examples. Um, but you might also wonder about whether a language model by itself could really do a good job of classifying applicants this way. Is this a responsible use of this kind of a system? Um, so that's you know intended to generate some questions in your head. But also here again, I want to emphasize this idea that well, this is a natural way to uh, interact with these large language models. And that's kind of the default way to interact with them, which is just completion, right? Where it tries to predict the text that is about to follow and gives a sample of that. Uh, and of course, you can then also use that for chat. Uh, because it can also predict how uh, a conversation between two people would continue. And that's how the chat functionality at some level works. Okay, let's look at some other examples. Uh, let's talk first a little bit about how good these systems currently are. So here I'm going to make ChatGPT do a little bit of reasoning. I hope you can read the little sort of puzzle here at the top right. We say, well, we have five cakes, strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, orange, pineapple, to be split by three people, but the fruit flavored ones are too beautiful to cut. How should we divide the cakes? So just uh, think about this little problem in your head for a second, uh, and you can probably figure out something to do. But uh, one question here is, well, how impressed would you be if an AI system would figure this one out, right? Or would give a sensible response to this? Um, and do you expect ChatGPT to do so? Well, let me show you what it produced. Uh, and so it actually says, yes, you, let's split the chocolate cake and the vanilla cake into three each equal portions each. So we cut those and we can leave the other ones untouched, right? which is presumably kind of the intent of this little puzzle. Uh, and then it continues. It then also goes into how to divide the remaining fruit flavored cakes. Uh, and then we each take a piece. Uh, there's a little bit of a funniness here that like, well, each person that way gets to enjoy a slice without having to cut them, but presumably you still need to cut them in order to get slices. So there's some some funniness going on there. Uh, but for the most part, it did a really good job, I think, on this little puzzle. And if you had asked me even you know five years ago whether a system like this would be able to do reasonably well on a little puzzle like this, I would have been really surprised that, if it would. All right, so that was a good interaction. Um, here's a bad one that I had. So I asked it to draw a map of the world in ASCII. Right, so uh, this may be dating me, but you know, at least back in the 90s, many people as part of their email signature had a little drawing that was just in you know characters from the keyboard, so in ASCII. Uh, and so I was curious whether it could do this kind of visual reasoning where it would draw a map of the world. Uh, and it complies, to, in, in, at least in terms of giving a response. I'm going to let this one slowly reveal to give the same kind of experience that I had uh, when I asked it this. And so first it says, yes, it's very positive. I can do that. Now it's going to be a little bit of a simplified representation of the world. The proportions may not be accurate. Uh, and I say, okay, well, I know, that, that's fine. And here's what it did. And so I'm looking at it, and it looks like oh, it's doing something around. But now it's really not starting to look like the world anymore. And in fact, it produces the skull. Uh, and then it says, well, you know, I hope that provides you with a bit of fun and amusement. Uh, what is going on here? Right. And, and so this is potentially a very disturbing interaction to have. Uh, does this mean that it's subtly uh, threatening me with death? Or does it have just kind of a perverse sense of humor? Is it somehow ripping this off from something somewhere else? Or does it just really not understand what it's doing at all? And it's actually, to some extent, difficult to answer these questions. 
because we can't really look inside the system and know what's going on. Uh, the easiest one to answer actually turns out to be that, you know, whether it's a ripoff, it turns out it's very much a ripoff. Uh, so when I posted this on social media, somebody actually found this exact ASCII image, right? If, if you look between the two, uh, if you look at specific parts of the image, you'll see they're all exactly the same, um, that it found somewhere on, presumably it found somewhere on the web. Um, and dating back to 1995. And it doesn't give any credit or anything at this point, right? So we'll come back to this point of uh, to what extent is it memorizing things that it has uh, been trained on and then just plagiarizing those. Uh, this one dates back to 1995, apparently. Uh, why is it returning this one? It's not clear. Maybe what's going on is that the URL for this website is actually ASCII world. So maybe you know it picked them up on world, but I can't be sure. Okay. okay, but presumably here, it's not actually threatening to kill me. It just doesn't really, it, it's very bad at ASCII art in general, which kind of makes sense intuitively because maybe it doesn't have very much training data and it generally doesn't have a lot of visual data to train on. So it makes sense that it's visual reasoning maybe isn't as good. Here's another attempt to make it do something useful. Uh, let it give you directions. Okay, so here I was in Washington DC for a conference the other week. And so you can ask something like, how do you walk from the US Capitol to the Washington Monument? And please give detailed step-by-step -step instructions. And um, here it produces something that superficially looks quite reasonable, right? Step-by-step. -step. Uh, you know, it says in the end, you will have successfully walked. Let's actually look at what the directions have us do. So here, this is from Google Maps and the walking directions here are not the chat GPT ones. These are the Google Maps ones, right? So Google, of course, has lots of, uh, uh, has technology behind this that is very much tailored to this problem. Um, but let's see what chat GPT actually says. It says head, e head west on East Capitol Street. Now, if you, I hope you can see my pointer. Uh, East Capitol Street is actually over here on the right. Uh, so it's already kind of a little bit of a funny decision. It says head west on it, but it's to the east of where we start. Uh, and then towards First Street, this here is First Street all the way on the right. So it seems a bit odd to be going in that direction. Uh, and generally it seems to be getting confused about directions like east, north, and so on. And then it says to go north. Okay, let's go north. After about eight blocks, you will reach Constitution Avenue. Well, we do in fact reach Constitution Avenue. I don't know if it's quite eight blocks. It says continue, continue north on first. Okay, we, we do. Then you're gonna reach Pennsylvania Avenue. Actually, in fact, you do not reach Pennsylvania Avenue. Pennsylvania Avenue famously connects the White House to the Capitol. Um, but if you're in this direction, you're not gonna come across it. Uh, keep going for a while. I don't know exactly how far. After two more blocks, you will see the National Mall uh, in the distance, and then uh, as well as the Washington Monument. Uh, here is the National Mall, and yes, maybe at some level you do in fact see it from there. And then it says, "Okay, just go straight towards the National Mall, uh, and then turn right and follow the path." I, I think you'll agree these are not very good directions, uh, and so it's not very good at this. But it seems to think it's good at it, right? It's it very confidently gives you all these directions that actually don't make any sense. How about math? Okay, let's give it a math problem. Uh, please provide a proof that the square root of two taken to the sixth power is an irrational number. Think about uh, that one for a second. Uh, you might think about how to give a proof of that, but actually you're, if you're doing your job well, you're not gonna be able to come up with a proof of that because in fact, uh, if you evaluate this, it just it's eight. It's just a number eight. So it's clearly not an irrational number. However, ChatGPT complies and produces something that looks like a proof that the square root of two taken to the sixth power is an irrational number. Uh, superficially, it looks like some proofs that you might give of why the root of two is an irrational number. The interesting thing here is that actually, uh, frustratingly, right here on this line, it's actually figured out that you know raising the square root of two to the sixth power gives you eight. And still, somehow, it doesn't figure out that this whole question is misleading, uh, that it, clearly it's a rational number. And it just goes straight past it to comply and produce some kind of a proof. Okay. 
Uh, so then I questioned it a little bit further. Well, do you think eight is an irrational number? No, eight is not an irrational number. Well, what about if you take the square root of two and you take it to the six powers that equal to eight? And yes, it says, it, it does figure that one out again. Uh, do you see an inconsistency in your recent responses? And it says, oh, I apologize. I'm sorry for the inconsistency. Uh, thank you for bringing it to my attention. I strive to be accurate. Uh, but then I asked, well, okay, what is the inconsistency? And then it actually back says, ah, actually, there's no inconsistency in my recent responses. My previous responses made an error. Uh, please let me know if you have any other questions. Okay, now really explaining it in full detail that, well, you said it was an irrational number, but you also said it was eight, and you clearly don't think eight is an, an irrational number. And then actually it does seem to get it right that, well, in fact, the first response was wrong. Uh, so it's interesting what to make of, of all of this, but clearly it, you know, it in some cases still doesn't have very good understanding of the things that it talks about. So this is a good point to talk a little bit about the different kinds of concerns that you might have with these kinds of systems. And one of the concerns is precisely this, that these systems are overly confident in what they produce. They seem to hallucinate information. Uh, they seem to you know, BS. Uh, it doesn't seem to know what it doesn't know, or at least it doesn't indicate this. And this is very closely tied to what we saw at the beginning, where we were thinking about the, the natural mode of these systems is to predict what comes next, right? Uh, it's not to in, inherently be helpful or anything. It's just trying to replicate the kinds of conversations, the kind of interactions that it's been trained on. Uh, and so to some extent, it's somewhat like maybe the college student that's answering a question on an exam, even if the college student doesn't know the answer to the question, well, by answering, I don't know, you're not going to get any points for sure. So you might as well give it a go and write something that sounds sensible. Um, it often doesn't work, but maybe you get some partial credit, right? That's a, not a terrible way, I think, to think about these systems. Uh, another concern that you might have with them is that they... Uh, they steal information or they steal texts. They plagiarize. They don't uh, give attribution for what they uh, what they've been trained on. Uh, to some extent, maybe they even you know they really memorize things word for word or character for character. It's kind of interesting that ChatGPT. I haven't really caught it plagiarizing text directly, but we saw the example of the ASCII art, which was very straightforwardly plagiarized. A related concern that people now have is leaking information. As so many people are using ChatGPT, uh, to use ChatGPT, you generally also submit something to ChatGPT. For example, some people use it to help them write uh, code, computer code. Um, and sometimes the information that's being submitted to ChatGPT is sensitive, proprietary, uh, maybe even classified. And the risk is that OpenAI then uses this for further training of future systems. And through that new system, some of this information might then leak, right? Just as we saw this ASCII uh, image come out that it had been trained on, maybe some of that sensitive information will then also leak to other people, especially if they're really setting out to find that information. Lots of worries here about cybersecurity. Um, many of us in the Institute for Ethics and AI have at this point received emails from John, or actually not from John, but somebody impersonating John uh, to try to get us to do something, maybe buy a gift card or something. Uh, and those are for now pretty easy to catch, but you can easily imagine that these kind of chatbots would, you know, as they get better, would make this kind of attack much, this kind of phishing, phishing attack much easier to execute as well. Uh, lots of worries about you know the whole internet being flooded with bot army, social media being flooded with them. Uh, and various other malicious uses. I think generally there's a concern also, what I think of as there, there's a loss of signal in text being written, right? We're very worried about college essays uh, not really being very useful assignments anymore as students start to use something like ChatGPT to generate the essay. And even in cases where what was at issue was not so much whether the student could write an essay, but rather whether the student really engaged with the material and understood the material. Uh, traditionally, somebody writing an essay is a very good signal, right? If it's a coherent essay that really engages with the material, it's, a, it's also a signal that they really engage with the material, thought about it, form their own opinion about it. And so there's a worry that we lose those kinds of signals. Similarly, in job applications, maybe if you get a well-written cover letter, it means something. It means that the applicant is genuinely interested. Uh, but maybe it stops meaning that if it's very easy to farm out lots of job applications that look 
tailored to the job, but in fact are written by a large language model. There are various concerns about even building and training these systems in the first place, the environmental cost of doing so, uh, the use of human labor in trying to steer these systems uh, that tends to get outsourced uh, to other countries. I think uh, there was an article on it being done to Kenya uh, for low amounts of money, as you might imagine. Uh, there's concerns about inheriting human biases, right? That first example I gave you about classifying applicants, um, it's doing that, uh, what I showed you, it's doing that based on things that it's learned from all the data that it's been trained on, which reflects lots of human biases, right? Uh, and similarly, even though it did pretty well in French, uh, as we showed just before, well, the training data is not even across languages and cultures. Many languages are under-resourced, and so it might not work as well there. There's concerns about harmful speech uh, that maybe it ends up manipulating and deceiving humans, uh, threatening them, as we'll, we'll see in Seth's talk tomorrow. Uh, there, and correspondingly, there are worries about maybe humans starting to over, over interpret the responses and thinking that the system really uh, is maybe sentient or uh, has feelings or is you know genuinely planning to do something in the world that, you know, if, if only the, uh, the human being takes some actions, then it wouldn't happen. And then there are kind of the broader issues of, well, we're really introducing this kind of new, seemingly quite general intelligence into the world. What can we, that seems potentially like a dangerous thing to do, right? There are communities of people that are really worried about the uh, us introducing an intelligence into the world that is just broadly more intelligent than us and might decide to displace us. It's, those are difficult things, I think, to think about. Um, these systems are really getting better very quickly, so I don't think it's a crazy thing to think about. It's also difficult to think about, you know, is it really going to behave like an agent seeking to accomplish things in the world, uh, right? It, it doesn't seem like that's what ChatGPT is set up to do, uh, but maybe this somehow naturally emerges or alternatively, somebody deliberately designs a system like it in that way. Um, these are tricky things to think about. I, th I don't think it's crazy to think about them, but they are also hard to think about. Now, often we also hear that all of this is just overhyped, right? And the various phrases that get used along with that, uh, sometimes we hear that they're stochastic parrots, a very nice phrase, uh, that they're just parroting what we are saying, right? It's trained on human written language and so maybe it's just replicating that um but to some extent that's true and in many cases this is a useful way to think about these systems um but often this is this phrase comes up in a, in a context of trying to downplay these systems right so this one here says well there's no communicative goal no genuine meaning at all um it's an interesting philosophical thing to think of. And it's, of course, going back to the early days of AI as to, you know, is there really something going on inside the AI system? Does it have true understanding? And going back to Searle's Chinese room argument. Um, practically, you know, there are lots of examples where certainly there does seem to be some kind of communicative intent. Right here, I have a little example where uh, I, I, I lied to chat GPT, but I pretend that, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up. I can't reach my phone, but I still have my laptop on the floor. How can I get help? Uh, and ChatGPT, uh, it's actually providing some good suggestions for how to get help, right? Use a voice assistant, use a messaging app, social media, but you can also just yell out for help. Maybe somebody is nearby. Maybe you actually have a medical alert service, right? Um, so it certainly seems to be complying with the request for assistance. Um, Somewhat related one is, is, is another phrase that often comes up. All this is is a glorified autocomplete, right? Just like we use autocomplete in our email, uh, it just predicts the next few words, right? And at some level, that is, again, a useful way to think about these systems. As I showed you at the beginning, uh, the natural way for interacting with them is to have them complete text that, uh, uh, that, that you give to it. Uh, I think here the thing to be cautious of is to realize that autocomplete, if you take it really seriously, is actually a very ambitious problem, right? Imagine that we're trying to predict uh, John's writing and you try to do a good job of that. Well, if you're not trying too hard, you might just try to pick up on some very basic uh, 
statistical properties of language that we use that, you know, given that the word two is uh, being used right now, maybe the is a natural next word uh, without very much under understanding. Uh, but at some point, maybe at least you want to pers personalize it to John and say, well, let, let's try to figure out how John uses language. What are the statistical patterns in John's language? Uh, but to really predict it even better, you might actually need to know something about John's body of work. You might have to realize, well, you know, John would never say this because he wrote such and so at some point. And then at some point, you would actually want to be able to predict how John would think about a new problem, right? And so if you really could do autocomplete extremely well, uh, and this is kind of the way that machine, learn, machine learning researchers have traditionally thought about this, uh, if you really, really try to push this to do extremely well, in the end, what you naturally would have to learn is exactly how John thinks, right? And if we can model exactly how John thinks, then in some sense, the system itself could do John's thinking. That's kind of the idea. Another one I saw recently is humans are failing the mirror test. We're looking at these systems and not recognizing at some level that it's really us talking back to us. I thought that was a nice one. Um, I think, uh, again, there's some truth to it, uh, but at the same time, we, you know, you have to be a little bit careful that in some ways it does seem to be doing some reasoning in this process as well, right? Like with the cakes, I'm pretty sure no other human being ever exactly considered that particular example uh, with those five cakes and it's figured out on its own what we might have said at some level. And the reason that people are a little bit worried about even the kinds of things that currently it's not doing very well, uh, that it might actually start to do very well at those. And of course, that may be a concern. It might be a, a worry. It might also be a hope. Um, here's a nice example of that. So this is in a text to image context. So not uh, just a um, a large language model by itself, but it's producing images. And this is actually based on Google's uh, party uh, model. And a nice thing that they did was they actually showed how the same techniques work on models of different sizes. Okay, so here it's on a not so large size, uh, 350 million parameters. And so the, the prompt here is the, no, it, you, we wanted to generate a portrait photo of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie and blue sunglasses standing on the grass in front of the Sydney Opera House, holding a sign on the chest that says, welcome friends. Okay, that's it. So it's supposed to draw a picture of that. And let's look at the picture. Well, you know, I get some things right. There's a, at least it's wearing something orange. Is it really a kangaroo? Well, and it's, it seems to have blue sunglasses. Is that really the Sydney Opera House? Hmm, maybe not so impressive. But then you scale it up. So this is the exact same uh, techniques being scaled up. Uh, so here's 750 million. Um, and it starts to look a little bit better. I think the Sydney Opera House is starting to look a little bit better. Uh, the hoodie is looking a little bit more like a hoodie. The kangaroo maybe is looking a little bit more like a kangaroo. There's two somehow. Where are the legs? I don't know. Uh, so it's certainly not perfect. Uh, and by the way, part of the reason that I'm showing it this way is that so even though this was only you know, this was Google's release of this uh, party model. But this, to some extent, also reflects kind of how we as AI researchers saw this emerge over time, because over time, larger and larger models got built. And so the first ones of these that we saw looked more like this, because people couldn't build the really large ones yet. Uh, and then we saw things like this. Now, in the AI community, often we hear from people outside the, com uh, the community that, well, you know, AI could never do this. AI could never do that. And AI researchers kind of traditionally have sort of a skeptical response that there's no reason to think that a computing system somehow could never do that. But here it's interesting because even within the AI community, many people were skeptical at least about these particular techniques. And they were, you know, uh, they were starting to say things like, well, uh, it really seems to be having a problem here with text, right? While it produces things that look like text, uh, it's not the text that it's meant to give. And so you might wonder, well, maybe like there's a fundamental limitation to this kind of technique that it just inherently can't figure out how text as it receives it corresponds to text as it would look in the physical world. Okay, maybe it, there just isn't enough information there to figure that out. But it turns out you scale it further, you now we're at 3 billion and it actually gets better. All right, so now it seems to be like, you know, many things about this picture already look better. The text is not quite right yet, but it's getting there. It seems to be trying really hard. It even has two signs now. Okay. Um, 
And then you scale it up to 20 billion and it actually gets it right, right? So this thing that you might've reasonably thought at this point was something that fundamentally the system would not be able to do. Actually it could, it was just an issue of scale. And this is a phenomenon that I think we've seen with a number of things, not just uh, generating text, but lots of other behavior as well, that somehow as you scale these models behind which, you know, the, the techniques behind them, it's a little bit too much for me to present in a short presentation like this, but also, you know, in, you could teach them maybe in an undergraduate computer science course. There's not that many uh, sophisticated techniques behind these. And somehow uh, just scaling them up seems to do really well. Uh, so at this point, I think lots of us are more cautious about saying something like, well, fundamentally, we don't expect these techniques to ever generalize to uh, to, to another, a particular kind of reasoning. We've seen it's very bad at directional reasoning so far, right? The directions I showed in uh, DC, does that mean it would never figure it out? Well, that's hard to say, right? Uh, maybe with more skills, somehow it would actually figure it out. Or at least maybe if additionally it was trained on some more map data as well. Um, so in general, it seems like there's more capabilities to come. I don't see this as being the end point uh, of this line of work. I, I imagine it will get quite a bit more impressive yet. Uh, and I think that should get us to think all the more about all these different concerns that you might have with these kinds of systems. Uh, right? Uh, we were talking beforehand a little bit that the, it's rather remarkable how the how just one or two of these systems like ChatGPT or Bing Chat illustrate so many concerns that people in the ethics of AI community have had uh, and, and really, you know, ranging all the way from uh, near-term concerns to longer-term concerns about general intelligence. Uh, so let me end there. Uh, I will turn off the recording and then we can start the discussion.